An oil concession is essentially a circumstance here that results when you have, let's say, an underdeveloped country, certainly in the early 20th century, finds out it has oil. It does not have the expertise to produce that oil, nor necessarily the ready access to capital reserves. And if you can find those in combination, all the better. And so what the, what they, uh, the, the, the leadership of these, these countries do is that uh, they're content to allow foreigners to come in and uh, produce the oil. And initially, even to sell the oil, whereupon the country will get a cut of the profits that the country, that the, the company makes. And as I mentioned, the United States and the Great Britain were the only two countries in the early 20th century that had substantial oil production expertise, since they were uh, an industrial power and a, well, there were two industrial powers, the two major industrial powers, Germany aside. And so they came in and dominated. Now that's what an oil concession is, all right? And uh, these are authoritarian regimes. So there's another benefit that goes with this. If you're an authoritarian regime in here, whether it's in Iraq or Iran, some whatever, all right, you give an oil concession to a foreign company to come in and generate and produce those oil resource, uh, oil profits that you want, and you get a cut back. All right, what are they going to do with that money? If it's a regime in power, an authoritarian regime of one of sort, what they want to do is stay in power. And so they want to take that those that that cash and of course use it to reinforce their authoritarian control. There's many ways you can spend money in that. But it produces another benefit for the United States or the, the foreign country whose company comes for an oil concession. Because what that means is now that's a ready market to sell arms. And thus, as you can see here, this is, the, I believe I showed you this before, principal arms suppliers at the Middle East, you can see who dominates the United States in purple over here. All right, the British always have a large cut, secondary to that. Russia also a major arms seller in here, but the United States is prominent because it's a great deal, isn't it? I mean, you have a, you, one of your companies comes in, produces uh, uh, oil under an oil concession, works with the authoritarian regime, and then the authoritarian regime, wanting to stay in power, takes the profits that that that, that they've uh, uh, been given and uh, buys weapons from you. Uh, weapons is uh, weapons. The arms industry is a very lucrative business, so you get the double dip on that benefit. And all that production and those arms, all that's allied with your larger international uh, strategies. That's what was going on for much of the 20th century with respect to the Western powers in here. Uh, and by the way, it's still going on. It hasn't fundamentally changed at all. Are, is the United States therefore interested in the human rights, by and large, of, of these countries? Uh, no, it's, 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 not, uh, it's not a non-issue, but it's just not an issue with a whole lot of profile. All right, you have a nice warm relationship with the authoritarian regime. You support its authoritarian practices simply by providing it the material finances, if you would, uh, to support it. All right. The notion of democracy and human rights are all nice things to talk about on camera, but they don't—they're not going to result. You don't want to take the chance of alienating that uh, regime. That's what was up with the oil concessions. In fact, there used to be an old joke, probably still is in the Soviet Union, not the Soviet Union, in the uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia, that the main cultural forces in Saudi Arabia in the mid 20th century were Islam and Aramco. Aramco was the Arab American oil company. I suppose you can go to Iran and say, uh, uh, what was it? it was the Anglo American, excuse me, the Anglo Iranian oil company. All right. In any case. Okay. You're, we're in the middle of the mid, uh, the, the, the 20th century. We're primarily the United States and Great Britain who've, who've carved up the oil concessions in the Persian Gulf. The authoritarian regimes in the region benefiting from this. The regimes are, not necessarily the population. This leads to problems which still resonate to this day. Let me give you an example. I can give you many other examples. Let's just pick out some of the high profile ones. I'll ask you some basic questions about them on the test. All right. Have a look at this one right over here. All right. We have. The country of Iran. Well, 
another country in the region that is undemocratic, has an authoritarian in place. That authoritarian you can see right here, that's the Shah of Iran, Shah Rizab Talevi. Well, an amazing thing happened in 1951. In 1951, the Iranians uh, uh, did a remarkable thing amongst the Muslim governments in the region. The Iranians successfully ridded themselves of the dictatorship, the Shah, in 1951. And they established a parliamentary democracy with an elected leader by the name of Mohammad Mossadegh, which you can see right here. Mossadegh was a popular figure in Iran. He expressed the popular will of his people, more or less. Uh, he demanded a greater share of the revenues of Iranian oil, which largely went to the Brit was under British control, under a British concession. And you understand why you would need to ask for a greater percent of the country's oil wealth. It's because it's a democracy now, and then people have voted him in. They're expecting to be... Uh, to see the benefits of popular participation. They want more money to, 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 to develop an educational system that would make them competitive in the modern world. They want more infrastructure uh, to make them modern in terms of water systems, electric, all these type of things. People want a greater cut of their national resources, which, which is very lucrative, the oil profits. Well, when the British refused to give Iran a bigger cut of her own resources, Mossadegh asked again, and the British refused again. And then what Mossadegh did in 1951 is he nationalized the oil companies. Nationalized means they're now under national control. The country's oil is now under national control. That's what nationalization means, in other words. It isn't that you throw the British out. You just simply say, I'm sorry, but we're running in this institution from the top. You're welcome to stay. We want you to stay. You have expertise. You have access to capital, nevertheless. But the oil production is now nationalized. Therefore, we can get a, the cut we need from our own national resources. Now, the response to Mossadegh doing this was Operation Ajax. This was what, uh, that was the name of what the United States decided to do. The United States financed the overthrow of the Shah. The U.S. did this not only to have a pro-Western government in power, not that Mossadegh was against the West, but the United States interpreted it not being pro uh, the, the Iranian government not being pro Western because it was asking for more of its con uh, of the revenues from its own production. But from the United States position, the United States was the superpower after World War II and had assets uh, and uh, um, troops the world over. The last thing the United States wanted was to give other countries an example or incentive to ask for greater con uh, control of their own resources, at least a greater compensation from their own resources. And so therefore the United States wanted to quell that potentiality. And you might be saying, why is it that uh, the United States uh, financed the overthrow? Well, actually, it was the United States and the British. As you can see here, it's the MI6, which is the intelligence organization for the British, and the CIA did this. But remember, after World War II, let's say British is pretty much prostrate. The United States is now in control of the world economy, and the United States is the one country that has the international footprint, economically speaking, to see that uh, there's going to be a great threat, all right, to, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a threat, but uh, a lot of its profiteering will be compromised, all right? So the observation you want to make there is that the United States overthrew the a democratic regime. Really, the first democratic regime in this portion of the Persian Gulf, in fact, in the Persian Gulf. In fact, I would say in the Middle East, but of course, uh, uh, I would say in the Muslim Middle East, but you'd have to throw Turkey in as a democracy, but, uh, but a year before this, in effect, whatever. You get the point. The United States overthrew it and compromised its own political ideology, it's pro-democratic uh, assertions. That was in 1953. And of course, who did the United States decide to put back into power? Now that it got rid of the democratic regime, 
As you can see here, that's the Shah. The Shah was brought back and reinstalled. The dictator that the Iranians had gotten rid of. But of course, this is business. The Shah had to pay for this support from the United States and for getting his throne back. In return for U.S. support, the Shah agreed to allow uh, an international consortium of, of British and American, in fact, the British got 40%, the Americans got 40%, the French got 6%, the Dutch got 14%, if I recall, these companies to essentially run Iran, uh, Iran's oil. That was done for the next 25 years, of which the profits from the oil for that period of time would exclusively go to the foreigners, the Western powers. So Iran lost control of its oil for that alone. And of course, not only, and this is an interesting observation that ties in, I'm, I'm bringing up these examples because all, you'll see a same thread running through all these things connecting them together. Not only did the Shah further commit his oil resources to the West, having been put back into power in 1953, but he became, of course, a mega purchaser of American arms, which was in a very lucrative contract for the United States. You have to also say that the Shah was also seen as being vigorously anti-communist and therefore would be committed to keep the Russians out, which was the major geopolitical competitor of the United States. So getting rid of American democracy by the United States was a small price to pay for keeping out a non-democratic communism and getting uh, the threat of it anyway, and getting secure oil productions out of Iran. And by the way, the irony is that in contrast to today, when we look at Iran, Iran during the, the, the later portion of the 50s, right on up to 1979, was the most Western-oriented state in the Middle East because under the Shah, under his dictatorial regime, of course, he was cl closely allied to the West. And so, as sort of indicated here, women had more status. Islam, the Islam as an institution was... Uh, was marginalized as a cultural force. It was, of course, very relevant, but was marginalized. It was a clear second to Western products and oil production politics. So the, the Iran used to be considered the sort of the cosmopolitan, very Western-oriented Middle Eastern country amongst Muslim countries. Now, it will surprise no one at all that you put the Shah back in, he was already thrown out for being a corrupt uh, governance. The Shah had learned little, having been placed back into power from his previous experience. And uh, the growing stratification of wealth in the country, which was tied to the corrupt regime of the Shah, who saw most of the profits go to himself and, uh, and to uh, a small coterie of elite oligarchs, the Shah used the same oppressive methods that he had used before. He had a secret police force called the Savak, uh, who disappeared people, who tortured people. In fact, if I had time and if we were in class, I would talk about the use of soccer stadiums all right, uh, in terms of gathering dissidents and, uh, shall we say, uh, interrogating them. But as another matter, the point is that the Shah, Shah's repression in his own country resulted in another revolution against the Shah. Well, this one, a violent revolution, not unlike the 50, not like the 51 revolution where the po uh, there was a popular uprising against him. And not only did the Iranian people chuck the Shah out, but of course they were rather angry at the United States because the United States was seen as the principal backer of the Shah, of course. They're the ones who supported his return. It was the United States who were perceived by many Iranians as parasites on the oil industry. It was the United States was seen also as a corrupter of national independence. So there was a general disenchantment with the West. Even though this had been a cosmopolitan, Western-oriented society during the Shah's period of time, 
Unfortunately, there was also the acknowledgement that the West was fundamentally interested in oil revenues and not necessarily in the growth of civil society and human rights and equity and opportunity for common people in Iran. And the result of this 79 revolution is that this fella comes into power, Ayatollah Khomeini. He comes in in 1979. Khomeini leapt through a window of opportunity. This revolution wasn't about Khomeini, but he saw an opportunity. He had been in exile. Uh, I think it was in Switzerland and France for a period of time. Whatever, he had been in exile because he was against the Shah. But Khomeini was, of course, uh, a cleric, a churchman, a, a very conservative Muslim, and he is vigorously anti-American. He's the person who coined the term the United States as the, quote, great Satan, unquote. And what Khomeini did was establish a theocracy. And you know what a theocracy is. I already gave you a definition. A theocracy is a state where the political leadership and the religious leadership is the same. And so Iran becomes a very conservative Shia Muslim state in 1979. The state that you see today that the United States has such a, a prickly relationship with that the very conservative Muslim state is the state that was produced at this time with the Ayatollah coming into power. And of course, the new regime that came in under the Ayatollah went well beyond the expressed desires of urban Iranians. And of course, he would end up restricting Iranian freedoms himself to an unimaginable degree. There would be no freedom of worship, no freedom of travel. Women would largely dress who had dressed in Western uh, wear, uh, excuse me, uh, apparel, who could wear makeup and the like, well, they had to return to the traditional Muslim dress, the abaya and the hijab. There would be no democracy. Something that we know Iranian society was well inclined to. Well, the Shah, excuse me, the uh, Ayatollah here saw an opportunity and he leapt through that window of opportunity. In fact, many of the revolutionaries themselves who had gone up against the Shah, they had to flee into exile once the Ayatollah came into power. So therefore, as I said, the present conservative theocratic government that you see in Iran today is not a product of simple Iranian choices or religious intoxication, but largely the reaction to American power politics in the mid-20th century. This point is rarely mentioned in the United States, just complaints about the conservative Iranian government. Quite righteous complaints, I, I, could, uh, I might add. Nobody's suggesting that this, Iran, this government is, uh, is, isn't authoritarian. It certainly is. Are there human rights abuses? Of course there are. Nobody's suggesting this is some virtuous regime. But it, uh, may, there are those who would say that the West, and certainly the United States, has lost its right to complain about the lack of civil society and democratic governments when, since it has vigorously suppressed, in fact, ejected uh, local attempts to establish just that. Keep this in mind. This is a classic example of if you do not allow civil society, uh, you'll see the implications later. If you do not have civil society, an opportunity for people to institutionally express their discontent with the system and push for change in a legal fashion, you're going to get change in a in a in a, a unlegal fashion, in a fashion that's usually violent. And the change, uh, what uh, usually is going to emerge, is going to be another form of authoritarianism. Keep that in mind. You'll see the implications. All right. So that regime over here, the United States complains about, the United States played a role in generating. It's not entirely responsible, but it played a role. It can't very well easily complain about it in any case. In fact, when the uh, Ayatollah came into power, a number of Iranian students who were mad at the United States for its long-standing anti-democratic meddling in Iran and profiteering off Iranian oil, they actually overran the U.S. Embassy. And they would hold 52 U.S. hostages for 444 days as the world watched and the United States was outraged. And what the Iranians wanted, who were holding the Americans in the embassy, they wanted the United States to turn the Shah back over to them, because, by the way, because the Shah fled into exile. And so they wanted the Shah back to be tried for his crimes, many crimes against the Iranian people. And by the way, they also wanted a written promise from the United States. The United States would no longer meddle in Iranian internal affairs. And of course, the United States did not turn the Shah over. 
although the United States uh, did deny their, the, their right to the Shah to stay in the United States, by the way. I mean, uh, he had come, by the way, for uh, some medical care. But the United States had no use for him after that. And uh, they didn't want him staying in the United States. The United States, you understand, uh, this is power politics. There's no uh, love or allegiance or loyalty in it. In any case, and of course, the United States didn't sign any statement saying they wouldn't intervene in anybody's affairs. None of the Iranian demands were met. And of course, terrorism, however you wish to define this, would profit from these events in that this theocratic regime, the, uh, the Shia regime of the Ayatollah in Iran after 1979, energized Shia Muslims everywhere to act out against the status quo. You got to remember, Shia have felt themselves to be persecuted in the region. Not necessarily by the United States, but by Sunni Muslims. The majority of Islam is Sunni, as you well know. And the Shia have often seen themselves as persecuted, and they had successfully taken on the West and shown those Sunni regimes to be nothing but collaborative regimes from their point of view with the West. And so Shia all over the Middle East were energized by these events in Iran post-1979. Understand that what the United States wanted it, it took down a democracy because what you do as an outside power, I talked about the historical role of outside powers coming in and uh, fragmenting this region, outside powers which the locals can't resist because the locals are fairly, fairly weak. But what the outside powers want are compliant vassal states, often under a dictatorship. It doesn't have to be, but it's the easiest. All right. They're interested in having an ally who will work with their foreign policy initiatives. They want a compliant ally. That's what the outside powers does. That includes the United States in the 20th century. Not necessarily interested in the ideology, all right, or even the religion. I'll give you some examples where the United States actually has favored very conservative, radical Islam. I'll give you some examples of that. Do you think the United States is fundamentally against that? I'll show you, some, show you how that's not necessarily the case. What you want is a compliant, somebody who works with you. You don't much care about their human rights violations. All right. All right. Okay, the United States and Iran since 1979 have had a very, very prickly relationship. Very prickly. The United States calls Iran a terrorist state, a terror supporting state. We'll talk about some of that here soon enough. All right. I mean, it, 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 there's plenty of things to legitimately complain about Iran and the United States. Okay, but what has really grew up producing tension between Iran and the United States, certainly in the last 20 years, has been this issue. Iran has been enriching uranium, ostensibly giving Iran the capacity in a number of years, and it's always, these projections always change. Some people say, oh, it's, you know, three months. Some people say two years. Who knows? Ostensibly, Iran will have uh, access or capacity to, uh, to produce nuclear weapons. And therefore, the United States and its allies oppose this, saying Iran is a sponsor of terrorism, and the last thing we want to do is give them a, a nuclear device or allow them to have a nuclear device. The United States, uh, you know, has said things like Iran clearly has no need for uh, nuclear energy since it has a lot of oil. And certainly it has no need for a nuclear weapon since, un unless it's thinking of making mischief. Iran said you know, the reasons why Iran wants a nuclear weapon, there's certainly not publicly expressed as a desire to use these type of things. I can assure you that uh, using such a thing would end up in the removal of Iran from existence. All right. But Iran's, rather than being something that fanatical Muslims want just to have so they can bring about the end of the world, that's so, you know, you can find individuals who are motivated by these type of things. But governments, no. Governments want to stay in, a, in, in power and survive. Well, the reason why Iran wants to have a nuclear deterrent is because at the end of the day, if you have nuclear weapons, you get respect. There you have it. You get respect. It's a weapon of mass destruction. You get respect. You wouldn't get otherwise.
You can have a war with conventional weapons, and that means that's going to be the, the side that's going to win is going to uh, the, be the best who, uh, who can organize and produce conventional weapons and, of course, project them. That's going to be the Western powers. But with nuclear weapons, all of a sudden the, the tables are much more even, shall we say, since people, since both sides can produce comprehensive destruction, of which nobody gains in the aftermath. Therefore, why does Iran want a nuclear weapon? Look at the geography of Iran here. There's Iran. Iran feels itself to be surrounded by hostile nuclear armed powers. You have the United States that went into Iraq in 2003. Iran has been aggressed upon itself. Well, whatever. Let's not worry about that. The United States went into Iraq. All right. You've got Israel with nuclear weapons. You had Russian interests to the north when this was part of the Soviet Union. Had, had uh, up here in uh, Azerbaijan had uh, nuclear forces. There you got the United States, who's still in Afghanistan as a nuclear power. Pakistan has nuclear weapons, and India has nuclear weapons. Look at Iran, it feels itself to be beleaguered, and therefore it would like to have a nuclear weapon just as a deterrent to keep people. Uh, from aggressing upon it, especially since the United States, which is on both sides of Iran, right? Afghanistan and Iraq. The United States has pulled out of Iraq here, obviously, in the last few years. All right. Uh, but look at the position from Iran. Iran, by and large, referred to, was referred to by the United States as, as you can see here, the axis of evil. And let me talk about that axis momentarily here on the next tape.